Chapter 7 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 7 the overseer was calling over the names of the whole from a little book, and the first name I heard was that of my companion, Lydia. As she did not answer, I said, Master, the woman that carries her baby on her back will be here in a minute. He paid no attention to what I said, but went on with his call. As the people answered to their names, they passed off to the cabins, except three, two women and a man, who, when their names were called, were ordered to go into the yard in front of the overseer's house. My name was the last on the list, and when it was called I was ordered into the yard with the three others. Just as we had entered, Lydia came up out of breath with the child in her arms, and following us into the yard, dropped on her knees before the overseer, and begged him to forgive her. "'Where have you been?' said he. Poor Lydia now burst into tears, and said, I only stopped to talk a while to this man, pointing at me. But indeed, Master Overseer, I will never do so again. Lie down, was his reply. Lydia immediately fell prostrate upon the ground, and in this position he compelled her to remove her old tow linen shift, the only garment she wore, so as to expose her hips, when he gave her ten lashes with his long whip every touch of which brought blood and a shriek from the sufferer. He then ordered her to go and get her supper, with an injunction never to stay behind again. The other three culprits were then put upon their trial. The first was a middle-aged woman, who had, as her overseer said, left several hills of cotton in the course of the day, without cleaning and hilling them in a proper manner. She received twelve lashes, the other two were charged in general terms with having been lazy and of having neglected their work that day. Each of these received twelve lashes. These people all received punishment in the same manner that it had been inflicted upon Lydia. And when they were all gone, the overseer turned to me and said, Boy, you are a stranger here yet, but I called you in to let you see how things are done here and to give you a little advice. When I get a new negro under my command, I never whip at first. I always give him a few days to learn his duty, unless he is an outrageous villain, in which case I anoint him a little at the beginning. I call over the names of all the hands twice every week, on Wednesday and Saturday evenings, and settle with them according to their general conduct for the last three days. I call the names of my captains every morning, and it is their business to see that they have all their hands in their proper places. You ought not to have stayed behind to-night with Lyd, but as this is your first offence I shall overlook it, and you may go and get your supper. I made a low bow, and thanked Master Overseer for his kindness to me, and left him. This night for supper we had cornbread and cucumbers, but we had neither salt, vinegar, nor pepper with the cucumbers. I had never before seen people flogged in the way our overseer flogged his people. This plan of making the person who is to be whipped lie down upon the ground was new to me, although it is much practiced in the South, and I have since seen men and women, too, cut nearly in pieces by this mode of punishment. It has one advantage over tying people up by the hands, as it prevents all accidents from sprains in the thumbs and wrists. On Monday morning I heard the sound of the horn at the usual hour, and repairing to the front of the overseer's house, found that he had already gone to the corn-crib, for the purpose of distributing corn among the people for the bread of the week, or rather for the week's subsistence, for this corn was all the provision that our master or his overseer usually made for us. I say usually, for whatever was given to us beyond the corn, which we received on Sunday evening, was considered in the light of a bounty bestowed upon us, over and beyond what we were entitled to or had a right to expect to receive. 
When I arrived at the crib, the door was unlocked and open, and the distribution had already commenced. Each person was entitled to half a bushel of ears of corn, which was measured out by several of the men who were in the crib. Every child above six months old drew this weekly allowance of corn, and in this way women who had several small children had more corn than they could consume, and sometimes bartered small quantities with the other people for such things as they needed and were not able to procure. The people received their corn in baskets, old bags, or anything with which they could most conveniently provide themselves. I had not been able since I came here to procure a basket or anything else to put my corn in, and desired the man with whom I lived to take my portion in his basket with that of his family. This he readily agreed to do, and as soon as we had received our share we left the crib. The overseer attended in person to the measuring of this corn, and it is only justice to him to say that he was careful to see that justice was done us. The men who measured the corn always heaped the measure as long as an ear would lie on, and he never restrained their generosity to their fellow slaves. In addition to this allowance of corn, we received a weekly allowance of salt, amounting in general to about half a gill to each person, but this article was not furnished regularly, and sometimes we received none for two or three weeks. The reader must not suppose that on this plantation we had nothing to eat beyond the corn and salt. This was far from the case. I have already described the gardens or patches cultivated by the people, and the practice which they universally followed of working on Sunday for wages. In addition to all these, an industrious managing slave could contrive to gather up a great deal to eat. I have observed that the planters are careful of the health of their slaves, and in pursuance of this rule they seldom expose them to rainy weather, especially in the sickly seasons of the year, if it can be avoided. In the spring, and early part of the summer, the rains are frequently so violent, and the ground becomes so wet, that it is injurious to the cotton to work it, at least whilst it rains. In the course of the year there are many of these rainy days, in which the people cannot go to work with safety, and it often happens that there is nothing for them to do in the house. At such times they make baskets, brooms, horse collars, and other things which they are able to sell amongst the planters. The baskets are made of wooden splits, and the brooms of young white oak or hickory trees. The mats are sometimes made of splits, but more frequently of flags, as they are called, a kind of tall rush which grows in swampy ground. The horse or mule collars are made of husks of corn, though sometimes of rushes, but the latter are not very durable. The money procured by these and various other means, which I shall explain hereafter, is laid out by the slaves in purchasing such little articles of necessity or luxury as it enables them to procure. A part is dispersed in payment for sugar, molasses, and sometimes a few pounds of coffee, for the use of the family. Another part is laid out for clothes for winter, and no inconsiderable portion of his pittance is squandered away by the misguided slave for tobacco, and an occasional bottle of rum. Tobacco is deemed so indispensable to comfort, nay to existence, that hunger and nakedness are patiently endured to enable the slave to indulge in this highest of enjoyments. There being few towns in the cotton country, the shops or stores are frequently kept at some cross-road or other public place, in or adjacent to a rich district of plantations. To these shops the slaves resort, sometimes with, and at other times without, the consent of the overseer, for the purpose of laying out the little money they get. Notwithstanding all the vigilance that is exercised by the planters, the slaves, who are no less vigilant than their masters, often leave the plantation after the overseer has retired to his bed, and go to the store. The storekeepers are always ready to accommodate the slaves, who are frequently better customers than many white people, because the former always pay cash, whilst the latter almost always require credit. 
In dealing with the slave, the shopkeeper knows he can demand whatever price he pleases for his goods, without danger of being charged with extortion, and he is ready to rise at any time of the night to oblige friends who are of so much value to him. It is held highly disgraceful on the part of storekeepers to deal with the slaves for anything but money, or the coarse fabrics that it is known are the usual products of the ingenuity and industry of the negroes. But notwithstanding this, a considerable traffic is carried on between the shopkeepers and slaves, in which the latter make their payments by barter. The utmost caution and severity of masters and overseers are sometimes insufficient to repress the cunning contrivances of the slaves. After we had received our corn, we deposited it in our several houses, and immediately followed the overseer to the same cotton field in which we had been at work on Sunday. Our breakfast this morning was bread, to which was added a large basket of apples from the orchard of our master. These apples served us for a relish with our bread, both for breakfast and dinner, and when I returned to the quarter in the evening, Dinah, the name of the woman who was at the head of our family, produced at supper a black jug containing molasses, and gave me some of the molasses for my supper. I felt grateful to Dinah for this act of kindness, as I well knew that her children regarded molasses as the greatest of human luxuries, and that she was depriving them of the highest enjoyment to afford me the means of making a gourd full of molasses and water. I therefore proposed to her and her husband, whose name was Nero, that whilst I should remain a member of the family, I would contribute as much towards its support as Nero himself, or at least that I would bring all my earnings into the family stock, provided I might be treated as one of its members, and be allowed a portion of the proceeds of their patch of garden. This offer was very readily accepted, and from this time we constituted one community as long as I remained among the field hands on this plantation. After supper was over, we had to grind our corn, but as we had to wait for our turn at the mill, we did not get through this indispensable operation before one o'clock in the morning. We did not sit up all night to wait for our turn at the mill, but as our several turns were assigned us by lot, the person who had the first turn, when done with the mill, gave notice to the one entitled to the second, and so on. By this means nobody lost more than half an hour's sleep, and in the morning everyone's grinding was done. We worked very hard this week. We were now laying by the cotton, as that is termed. That is, we were giving the last weeding and hilling to the crop, of which there was on this plantation about five hundred acres, which looked well and promised to yield a fine picking. In addition to the cotton, there was on this plantation one hundred acres of corn, about ten acres of indigo, ten or twelve acres in sweet potatoes, and a rice swamp of about fifty acres. The potatoes and indigo had been laid by, that is, the season of working in them was past, before I came upon the estate, and we were driven hard by the overseer to get done with the cotton to be ready to give the corn another harrowing and hoeing before the season should be too far advanced. Most of the corn in this part of the country was already laid by, but the crop here had been planted late and yet required to be worked. We were supplied with an abundance of bread, for a peck of corn is as much as a man can consume in a week if he has other vegetables with it, but we were obliged to provide ourselves with the other articles necessary for our subsistence. Nero had corn in his patch, which was now hard enough to be fit for boiling, and my friend Lydia had beans in her garden. We exchanged corn for beans, and had a good supply of both. But these delicacies we were obliged to reserve for supper. We took our breakfast in the field from the cart, which seldom afforded us anything better than bread, and some raw vegetables from the garden." Nothing of moment occurred amongst us in this first week of my residence here. On Wednesday evening, called Settlement Night, two men and a woman were whipped. But circumstances of this kind were so common that I shall in future not mention them unless something extraordinary attended them. 
I could make wooden bowls and ladles, and went to work with a man who was clearing some new land about two miles off, on the second Sunday of my sojourn here, and applied the money I earned in purchasing the tools necessary to enable me to carry on my trade. I occupied all my leisure hours for several months after this in making wooden trays and such other wooden vessels as were most in demand. These I traded off in part to a storekeeper, who lived about five miles from the plantation, and for some of my work I obtained money. Before Christmas I had sold more than thirty dollars' worth of my manufactures, but the merchant with whom I traded charged such high prices for his goods that I was poorly compensated for my Sunday toils and nightly labors. Nevertheless, by these means I was able to keep our family supplied with molasses and some other luxuries, and at the approach of winter I purchased three coarse blankets, to which Nero added as many, and we had all these made up into blanket coats for Dinah, ourselves, and the children. About ten days after my arrival we had a great feast at the quarter. One night, after we had returned from the field, the overseer sent for me by his little son, and when I came to his house he asked me if I understood the trade of a butcher. I told him I was not a butcher by trade, but that I had often assisted my master and others to kill hogs and cattle, and that I could dress a hog or a bullock as well as most people. He then told me he was going to have a beef killed in the morning at the great house, and I must do it, that he would not spare any of the hands to go with me, but he would get one of the house boys to help me. When the morning came, I went according to orders to butcher the beef, which I expected to find in some enclosure on the plantation, but the overseer told me I must take a boy named Tony from the house, whose business it was to take care of the cattle, and go to the woods and look for the beef. Tony and I set out some time before sunrise, and went to a cow pen about a mile from the house, where he said he had seen the young cattle only a day or two before. At this cow pen we saw several cows waiting to be milked, I suppose, for their calves were in an adjoining field, and separated from them only by a fence. Tony then said we should have to go to the long savannah, where the dry cattle generally ranged, and thither we set off. This long savannah lay at the distance of three miles from the cow pen, and when we reached it, I found it to be literally what it was called, a long savannah. It was a piece of low, swampy ground, several miles in extent, with an open space in the interior part of it, about a mile long, and perhaps a quarter of a mile in width. It was manifest that this open space was covered with water through the greater part of the year, which prevented the growth of timber in this place though at the time it was dry, except a pond near one end, which covered perhaps an acre of ground. In this natural meadow every kind of wild grass common to such places in the southern country abounded. Here I first saw the scrub, and saw grasses, the first of which is so hard and rough that it is gathered to scrub coarse wooden furniture or even pewter, and the last is provided with edges somewhat like saw-teeth, so hard and sharp that it would soon tear the skin off the legs of any one who should venture to walk through it with bare limbs. As we entered this savanna, we were enveloped in clouds of mosquitoes and swarms of gall-nippers that threatened to devour us. As we advanced through the grass, they rose up until the air was thick and actually darkened with them. They rushed upon us with the fury of yellow jackets whose hive has been broken in upon, and covered every part of our persons. The clothes I had on, which were nothing but a shirt and trousers of tow linen, afforded no protection even against the mosquitoes, which were much larger than those found along the Chesapeake Bay, and nothing short of a covering of leather could have defended me against the gall-nippers. I was pierced by a thousand stings at one time, and verily believe I could not have lived beyond a few hours in this place. Tony ran into the pond and rolled himself in the water to get rid of his persecutors, but he had not long been there before he came running out as fast as he had gone in, hallooing and clamoring in a manner wholly unintelligible to me. 
He was terribly frightened, but I could not imagine what could be the cause of his alarm, until he reached the shore, when he turned round with his face to the water, and called out, "'The biggest alligator in the whole world! Did, did not you see him?' I told him I had not seen anything but himself in the water, but he insisted that he had been chased in the pond by an alligator which had followed him until he was close into the shore. We waited a few minutes for the alligator to rise to the surface, but were soon compelled by the mosquitoes to quit the place. Tony said we need not look for the cattle here, no cattle could live amongst these mosquitoes, and I thought he was right in his judgment. We then proceeded into the woods and thickets, and after wandering about for an hour or more we found the cattle, and after much difficulty succeeded in driving a part of them back into the cow pen, and enclosing them in it. I here selected the one that appeared to be the fattest, and securing it with ropes we drove the animal to the place of slaughter. This beef was intended as a feast for the slaves, at the laying by of the corn and cotton, and when I had it hung up, and had taken the hide off, my young master, whom I had seen on the day of my arrival, came out to me, and ordered me to cut off the head, neck, legs, and tail, and lay them, together with the empty stomach and the harslet, in a basket. This basket was sent home to the kitchen of the great house by a woman and a boy, who attended for that purpose. I think there was at least one hundred and twenty or thirty pounds of this offal. The residue of the carcass I cut into four quarters, and we carried it to the cellar of the great house. Here one of the hind quarters was salted in a tub for the use of the family, and the other was sent as a present to a planter who lived about four miles distant. The two fore quarters were cut into very small pieces and salted by themselves. These, I was told, would be cooked for our dinner on the next day, Sunday, when there was to be a general rejoicing among all the slaves of the plantation. After the beef was salted down, I received some bread and milk for my breakfast, and went to join the hands in the cornfield, where they were now harrowing and hoeing the crop for the last time. The overseer had promised us that we should have holiday after the completion of this work, and by great exertion we finished it about five o'clock in the afternoon. On our return to the quarter, the overseer, at roll call, which he performed this day before night, told us that every family must send a bowl to the great house to get our dinners of meat. This intelligence diffused as much joy amongst us as if each one had drawn a prize in a lottery. At the assurance of a meat dinner, the old people smiled and showed their teeth, and returned thanks to Master Overseer, but many of the younger ones shouted, clapped their hands, leaped, and ran about with delight. Each family, or mess, now sent its deputy, with a large wooden bowl in his hand, to receive the dinner at the great kitchen. I went on the part of our family, and found that the meat dinner of this day was made up of the basket of tripe and other offal that I had prepared in the morning. The whole had been boiled in four great iron kettles, until the flesh had disappeared from the bones, which were broken in small pieces, a flitch of bacon, some green corn, squashes, tomatoes, and onions had been added, together with other condiments, and the whole converted into about a hundred gallons of soup, of which I received in my bowl for the use of our family more than two gallons. We had plenty of bread, and a supply of black-eyed peas gathered from our garden, some of which Dinah had boiled in our kettle whilst I was gone for the soup, of which there was as much as we could consume, and I believe that every one in the quarter had enough. I doubt if there was in the world a happier assemblage than ours on this Saturday evening. We had finished one of the grand divisions of the labors of a cotton plantation, and were supplied with a dinner which to most of my fellow slaves appeared to be a great luxury and most liberal donation on the part of our master, whom they regarded with sentiments of gratitude for this manifestation of his bounty. In addition to present gratification, they looked forward to the enjoyments of the next day, when they were to spend a whole Sunday in rest and banqueting, for it was known that the two forequarters of the bullock were to be dressed for Sunday's dinner, and I had told them that each of these quarters weighed at least one hundred pounds. 
Our quarter knew but little quiet this night. Singing, playing on the banjo, and dancing occupied nearly the whole community until the break of day. Those who were too old to take any part in our active pleasures beat time with their hands or recited stories of former times. Most of these stories referred to affairs that had been transacted in Africa, and were sufficiently fraught with demons, miracles, and murders to fix the attention of many hearers. To add to our happiness, the early peaches were now ripe, and the overseer permitted us to send on Sunday morning to the orchard and gather at least ten bushels of very fine fruit. In South Carolina they have very good summer apples, but they fall from the trees and rot immediately after they are ripe. Indeed, very often they speck rot on the trees before they become ripe. This speck rot, as it is termed, appears to be a kind of epidemic disease amongst apples, for in some seasons whole orchards are subject to it, and the fruit is totally worthless, whilst in other years the fruit in the same orchard continues sound and good until it is ripe. The climate of Carolina is, however, not favorable to the apple, and this fruit of so much value in the north is in the cotton region only of a few weeks' continuance, winter apples being unknown. Every climate is congenial to the growth of some kind of fruit tree, and in Carolina and Georgia the peach arrives at its utmost perfection. The fig also ripens well and is a delicious fruit. None of our people went out to work for wages today. Some few devoted a part of the morning to such work as they deemed necessary in or about their patches, and some went to the woods or the swamps to collect sticks for brooms and splits, or to gather flags for mats. But far the greater number remained at the quarter, occupied in some small work, or quietly awaiting the hour of dinner, which we had been informed by one of the house servants would be at one o'clock. Every family made ready some preparation of vegetables from their own garden, to enlarge the quantity, if not to heighten the flavor of the dinner of this day. One o'clock at length arrived, but not before it had been long desired, and we proceeded with our bowls a second time to the great kitchen. I acted, as I had done yesterday, the part of commissary for our family. But when we were already at the place where we were to receive our soup and meat into our bowls, for it was understood that we were with the soup to have an allowance of both beef and bacon to-day, we were told that puddings had been boiled for us, and that we must bring dishes to receive them in. This occasioned some delay, until we obtained vessels from the quarter. In addition to at least two gallons of soup, about a pound of beef, and a small piece of bacon, I obtained nearly two pounds of pudding made of cornmeal mixed with lard, and boiled in large bags. This pudding, with the molasses that we had at home, formed a very palatable second course to our bread, soup, and vegetables. On Sunday afternoon we had a meeting, at which many of our party attended. A man named Jacob, who had come from Virginia, sang and prayed, but a great many of the people went out about the plantation in search of fruits, for there were many peach and some fig trees standing along the fences, on various parts of the estate. With us this was a day of uninterrupted happiness. A man cannot well be miserable when he sees every one about him immersed in pleasure, and though our fare of to-day was not of a quality to yield me much gratification, yet such was the impulse given to my feelings by the universal hilarity and contentment which prevailed amongst my fellows, that I forgot for the time all the subjects of grief that were stored in my memory, all the acts of wrong that had been perpetrated against me, and entered with the most sincere and earnest sentiments in the participation of the felicity of our community. End of chapter 7